Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are around the world. This is Dr. Nelson Ogunshakin from FIDIC, uh, the CEO of FIDIC. I'm delighted to invite you and to welcome you to join us in the 12th in the series of the COVID-19 uh, webinar program. Today, we are looking at key you know, the economy, how do we start the economy? Uh, but more important, looking at the lesson learned from the government and what the governments are doing in different parts of the world. But actually, it's not so much of looking back, it's also looking forward of what we think the government should be doing. Uh, for those who've been following this program, this is the 12th in the series. We started a little while ago where we look at, you know, how the world respond to the issue. We went on to discuss the issue about force measure. Is this a big force measure in different parts of the world? There was a big question. Quite a lot of people attended that. We discussed joint venture. Uh, how is this impacting joint venture? Consultancy agreement. We went on to look at the risk insurance market and debated, you know, how best one should protect itself and dealing with claims. Also, we discussed alternative risk resolution that created a lot of momentum in the industry. Uh, we discussed digital as we are all working digital and virtual. We went out to look at the impact on people, health and safety and requirement. And we'll also look at the impact on balance sheet, the balance sheet of your business, how do you rise size your business. We'll also discuss crisis management and communication. Today, we are looking very much on the, how do we come out of these challenges that we find ourselves and get our industry back on. Of course, different parts of the world have, you know, pursue different strategy and different parts of the world are pursuing different timeline in the issue. Today, I'm so delighted to have eminent speakers you know, from around the world to join us. Uh, this particular program, like ever, would be one hour, 30 minutes. My introduction shouldn't last more than five minutes. And then I will be delighted to invite you know, our president to give us an opening speech and also his perspective on what is happening in America, which is quite interesting. And then thereafter, I will invite our vice president from Australia to give us his own perspective, Tony Barry. He will talk about what is happening in the Australasian area. But again, I'll be challenging him to give us his view of what is happening and also what we should encourage government to do as we come out. We've got three other speakers, starting off with Graham Ponting, who is our economist. He will give us a lot of statistics and make a comparison between the last major world challenges and now. And thereafter, we are extremely lucky to have, you know, Richard Trifle from KPMG, who will also, you know, give us his view from KPMG perspective global. When we have Mark Worrell from EIX to give us his perspective of finance and how we can re-engineer our industry. Altogether, we should finish this particular program by 1.30. Between now and then, we have a session. Uh, and I hope by one o'clock, wherever you are around the world, we will open the chat room up for individuals to raise questions and I will do my level best to make sure I convey those questions to the panelists. The questions are not for me, they're meant for the panelists. So please craft your question and make sure you can channel your questioning. Um, I will start the Q&A session about one o'clock, five minutes. Thereafter, I'll pick up the question from the floor and we should try and finish about 25 minutes past one. On that note, it is my pleasure once again to invite Bill Howard uh, the president of from the United States. Bill, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nelson. And first of all, I want to thank you um, and your fine secretariat staff for putting these webinars uh, on. Uh, this is our 12th webinar, and uh, they've all gone uh, very, very well. Uh, and under any circumstances, it would be a real challenge to conduct these webinars with a, a global audience uh, effectively when most of the staff is working from home uh, under the pressures of a pandemic, uh, the challenge is, is very, very difficult. And it's uh, very admirable uh, the way uh, you and your staff <clears throat> have been able to put these very important webinars together. So thank you very much for that. I'd also like to thank our speakers. Uh, we've uh, had the pleasure and uh, privilege of having some really fine subject matter experts at helping us address the different issues in these webinars. And I know they're all extremely busy with their firms and their families and, uh, and all sorts of other things under this pressure. So thank you very much uh, for all of them for participating. And finally, thanks to the audience for, uh, for joining us uh, today. We've uh, been very pleased with the number of, uh, of attendees. 
Uh, it's been very impressive and uh, it's been telling us that we're doing the right thing by putting these webinars on together. So, so a big thank you to everyone. Um, Nelson asked me to talk for hopefully just a very few minutes about what's going on in the United States and that's a challenge in itself. So I just want to sort of touch on uh, on some global or high level thoughts of what's happening in, in the USA. Uh, and I'm going to do so from uh, looking at federal uh, the federal government uh, situation and actions and then maybe talk just very quickly about states and municipalities. Uh, the federal government as a general uh, statement, has more financial resources to offer assistance, and they are doing so. They're offering assistance directly to people. That's about the first time I've ever heard of that. They're actually sending checks out to individuals. Uh, they're offering assistance to firms in a variety of ways, small businesses and large businesses. They're offering uh, assistance to, uh, to medical facilities, and a lot of that is going on to the tune of trillions of dollars. And um, there, the ability of the government to, to properly distribute uh, all of those uh, assets is, is really a challenge in fairness to them. Uh, it's a heck of a task and probably one that hasn't been uh, tried before, at least of this magnitude. Um, and uh, time will tell uh, how effective it is. In addition to the financial um, assistance, the federal government has the ability, primarily through our president, to mobilize the private sector and use federal agencies, including the military, to address issues. And there's some of that going on as well. Uh, there are <clears throat> private uh, companies that have been directed to uh, produce uh, PPE, uh, and uh, including masks and ventilators, et cetera, and other medical equipment. And there's initiative, there is an initiative just starting to have the capacity to produce hundreds of, I believe hundreds of millions, but a lot of, uh, of vaccines uh, when a vaccine uh, is developed and to produce that rapidly. And finally, the federal government is preparing guidelines to the states and municipalities to use when opening up the economies. And uh, all economies, all states are starting to open up as of uh, today. Uh, in, and these guidelines, of course, include uh, new ways of doing construction, uh, office space uh, criteria, including how many people you can have in an office uh, given a phase of, of startup. And uh, all of which the states have been uh, delegated that authority. Uh, and one of the factors would that, the, that I believe is a big one with the states is the states currently have to have balanced budgets as do municipalities. And um, the challenges caused by this uh, pandemic, I think are enormous for them and they'll probably need some federal assistance in that regard. The opening requirements in the states varies uh, as many of our states are very different um, and cities within the states actually have different challenges. But they all seem to have procedures in place to deal with problems as they arise. So if I believe the ability of all government levels in the United States is much, much better now at dealing with an outbreak of this disease, the medical facilities are better prepared and the testing is as well. And that's all very, very good. In terms of the future, um, I for one, and I think a lot of us are very concerned about the ability of states and local government in particular to fund needed infrastructure and, and other kinds of programs. They're probably gonna be under pressure if they don't get assistance to actually reduce staff. And I believe that if that happens, that could cause a problem for our profession, um, maybe not tomorrow, but in, at some time in the future when the ramifications of that uh, surface. Hopefully, the government will, uh, will the federal government will provide the uh, the needed assistance. But that brings me to the infrastructure um, situation that we talk about in all of these webinars. Um, despite the fact we have a pandemic, the need for infrastructure around the world has not changed. Um, the type of infrastructure might change a bit but there are still needs out there that's, that existed before the pandemic and still exist now. 
there's two billion people in the world without adequate sanitation and, and about half of those folks also have do not have access to clean drinking water. We have climate change issues all around the globe that we're all familiar with. We have aging infrastructure. We have new infrastructure requirements in developing countries. And as I mentioned, we have changing needs for infrastructure that are driven somewhat by this pandemic. What FIDIC is doing in that regard is uh, when these webinars start to wind down, we are going to start to reproduce our state of the world reports dealing with infrastructure needs to remind the global community that we really need to keep our eye on that ball. Um, and then finally, what, the, what our member associations can do. Um, our member associations in general have great relationships with government agencies, uh, international funding institutions, et cetera. And they need to be talking to, these go to the governments about what engineers and engineering firms can do uh, to help in the recovery area, including delivering the message that for every dollar spent on infrastructure, governments get a dollar 20 back. So it's a great investment. And I'm pleased to state that uh, the CEO of the American Council of Engineering Companies in the USA, Linda Dar, um, has been invited to join the President's uh, Great American uh, Economic Recovery Task Force. So she will have a seat at the table talking to congressmen and, sen and senators about this. All MAs, member associations, should be doing these kinds of things. So uh, I have the feeling that I just fed everyone with a bit of a fire hose. I know I, I, on the on the goal to be kind of brief, but uh, that's the highlights of what's happening uh, in the USA. So back to you, Nelson. Thank you very much, Bill. Thank you for that uh, bird eye view of the USA approach to the issue. I actually like the signposting about the message that both the Federation as FIDIC and also the member association in their respective country have a mandate to ensure that they have a seat at the table. This is very critical, extremely critical. Doesn't matter what we do at this level, if the engagement is not coming through to help the government to allow them to understand the challenges and to also to make sure they position the industry that will not find a solution. So Bill, thank you very much from that. I'm going to invite you know, Tony Barry from Australia, our vice president, to give us his own perspective on the subject. And Tony, and I'm making the focus is very much a quick look back but more important is looking forward. How do we come out of this? How do we kickstart the economy in your part of the world to make sure our industry is ready and we provide a solution that is sustainable? Tony, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Nelson. Um, so firstly, thank you all for the opportunity and, uh, and the Secretariat, uh, congratulations on this program. It's really been fantastic. So well done. I guess uh, Australia has been, and, and I'll include New Zealand in this, both of us have been relatively or affected in a very uh, minor way compared to many countries. Uh, the number of cases we have in each of our two countries uh, is actually very small as a percentage of the population and less than 10% of those more seriously affected countries. So it's true that we went into this virus uh, with a tremendous upswing on the curve but we've been able to bring those curves, as they're called, under control very, very quickly uh, to the point where New Zealand has lifted many of its restrictions now um, within the country. Obviously, uh, they're still protecting their border, as, as Australia is. Uh, but also in Australia, we have had no cases, no new cases for many days. Uh, in, uh, uh, I think it's five out of seven of our jurisdictions. So uh, state jurisdiction. So that's a uh, really a very, very good result. Uh, we're talking about one or two cases a day in New South Wales at the moment here in Victoria. Unfortunately, we have eight to 10. We have a different strain of the virus, interestingly, in Victoria. So our infection rate is, uh, and our, uh, the community transmission of this particular in, uh, variety is much higher uh, than occurred elsewhere in the country. Uh, all of our cases pretty much were imported um, if you look at every uh, trace, they've been able to track them back to people bringing it into the country and where they brought it in. And I guess uh, massive testing, 10,000 people per million, uh, massive testing rate uh, along with, um, we, we have six or over 6 million of us have downloaded an app which enables the government to tell 
who we're in contact with and all this sort of thing. So we're able to uh, track and trace uh, our contacts. And that's enabled them to isolate people very quickly who've been exposed to the virus. So the health response has been terrific. Uh, the government, from a leadership point of view, established a thing they call the National Cabinet, which is a totally informal structure in one view. Uh, it's uh, all the state premiers and uh, territory chief ministers uh, and, and our prime minister. Uh, and that national cabinet has steered us, uh, steered the country through and coordinated, if you like, the efforts of all governments in, in both uh, terms of dealing with the pandemic, but also in dealing with the economic impacts and response. Uh, the government has also established uh, what's called a, COVID, a national COVID coordination commission, which has very senior directors from every industry in the country on it, there's only about uh, 10 of them or so, but they, are, they do uh, represent all the major industries and they are advising the government on economically how to get out of the, or how to recover from the, the damage done by the virus and the, and the shutdown. Uh, the damage uh, for what it's worth in Australia, um, we've seen a pretty small increase in our unemployment rate uh, overall, but our uh, 20 to 29 year olds uh, have been very badly affected. Uh, huge uh, levels of unemployment in industries like hospitality, accommodation and food services, uh, as will be the case in many other countries. Uh, we have put in place huge measures to support both companies and individuals. In Bill's words, sending out the checks in Australia, rather than giving the checks to the individuals, the checks are given to the companies and uh, the companies are reimbursed for $1,500 per fortnight for uh, every worker that uh, is entitled uh, to participate in what's called the JobKeeper scheme. Uh, that has a cost to it of about 130 billion. It's gonna go through to uh, September 30th, I think. Um, and that uh, represents about 9% of GDP. So that's a pretty big uh, support mechanism on its own. For those people who've lost their jobs altogether, um, uh, there's a $14 billion job seeker program, uh, which is uh, designed to support those people who are unemployed. Um, so we, we are expecting to see unemployment rates uh, around 10% of, uh, of the, in Australia. We're expecting our worst industries probably to be up around 12 or 13% and uh, the better ones uh, down around six. So uh, government also put in place things like free childcare for essential workers and all, uh, all sorts of measures to support essential workers. And uh, interestingly, the construction industry was uh, regarded as an essential industry and it's kept going right through the pandemic. Australia has had a massive uh, focus on health and safety for many, many years, uh, nearly, it uh, must be nearly 30 years now. We've had legislation in there which is very tight and companies and construction companies were able to uh, replan their work and uh, maintain social distancing uh, during working uh, work procedures, etc. And that has worked very well. Having said that, of course, there, there are impacts on the construction industry and on your ability if you're a contractor to perform uh, the, the obligations under the contract. And to that end, uh, Consult Australia, Nicola Grayson's uh, the CEO, they have been lobbying government and very successfully uh, to get to a situation now where both at federal and state levels, uh, there are policy statements which have been issued, which uh, describe to government agencies how they are to treat uh, contracts and obligations in contracts under the COVID-19 situation. And that relief, I think has enabled our contractors, along with the job keeper program, uh, that uh, those, uh, uh, if you like, uh, measures have uh, an underpinned the continuing operation of that industry. Uh, from the consultant's perspective, uh, Consult Australia has been lobbying for many, many weeks now uh, to uh, provide government with advice on how infrastructure can uh, bring us back from a very difficult situation. And all of you be aware, we had a bushfire crisis. Uh, we have uh, several programs in place already 
uh, which involve uh, 600 billion for municipal governments, uh, areas affected by bushfires. And uh, those, uh, 600 million, sorry, uh, those, uh, that program uh, effectively is uh, simply replacing damaged infrastructure. So uh, that has, is one source of infrastructure work. The other is that the federal government is accelerating infrastructure programs um, and uh, funding for them, uh, as are the states, to ensure that we can grow the industry coming out of this and in fact create jobs. There's a, another element to it where there's a focus on high tech infrastructure and that, that, uh, that focus is also starting to realise a, a new set of programs in infrastructure which we will see come forward. Um, I think the, uh, if I was to say to you that uh, the support for industry generally, and I'm talking about all industries, has been fantastic. The industries that the government has not been able to support are largely around hospitality, restaurants and food services. Uh, they have been hit very hard. Uh, but we have now, as you've already, um, you already realise, this isn't a financial crisis. So Australia has had uh, our retirement funds, we call them superannuation funds, heavily invested in infrastructure for many years. And all of those funds are number one, obviously supporting their members, but also looking for places to uh, invest in the longer term and prepare to take a long view of it. And so that uh, the support they are providing um, and, and are prepared to provide into infrastructure projects uh, will be uh, called on in this uh, as we come through this. So you will see uh, infrastructure at the Commonwealth level, you'll see infrastructure or the national level, you'll see infrastructure at state level and municipal level, uh, all being part of uh, coming out of this. We have about $30 billion worth of capacity uh, that we can grow on top of the industry that we already have. And uh, there's a lot of reasons that capacity exists, uh, but uh, it is intended uh, to, to build that and uh, to develop that infrastructure spending further. Um, there is also, uh, it's slightly different, but there is also a realisation of what I'll call the strategic risks Australia faces. Um, due to our what had become a very strong dependence on imports and exports. And there's no doubt there will be a redirection of policy in a strategic sense to develop some key areas in, in manufacturing to make sure that the country's sovereignty, if you like, is preserved and, and stronger coming out of this. I think there has been a lot learned about uh, our weaknesses. Uh, obviously, we're very happy with the, the public health situation as, it, uh, as it's transpired here. But we have learned a lot about our, our exposures uh, to international uh, tensions um, and uh, they are playing out uh, daily. And I don't know who's aware of those, but they have, uh, we've seen an 80% tariff, for example, put on barley uh, imports uh, from Australia to China. We've seen our beef banned by China uh, from four of our uh, abattoirs and uh, all with spurious uh, reasons for doing so, but it's uh, supposedly all about our desire to see a World Health Organization investigation as to the cause. But that's, that's been a very interesting lesson and it's highlighted to Australia its exposures. And I do think we are gonna see Australia respond and look to its own security uh, a little bit further uh, as we go forward and that'll result also, I believe, in, in uh, new jobs being created. So I think um, a very interesting time, and I think we're in reasonable shape to come out of it, and there's a lot of activity going on to make sure we do. Thank you, Nelson. Thanks very much, Tony, for uh, that uh, bird-eye view of what is happening in Australasia. I'm delighted to know that the impact on people is minimal, uh, but I suspect the key message taken away is, once again, uh, there is capacity in Australia, for investment and the bushfire, which actually, you know, happened there uh, with all the things that needs to be done with COVID means that you know, there will be more focus for resources. Uh, I suspect the question for us is really, what is the wide implication at this point? I'm really going to invite you know, Graham Ponting, our economist, to give us a bird eye view of some of the statistics, because what is critical, people make comparison between the financial meltdown, 
with this particular one. One is an economic financial issue. This particular one is a pandemic. But you need to make reference to how we've dealt with it. So perhaps if you look at the statistics, it will help us to go back into Richard later on and Mark Warrow to see some of the solutions that we'll be looking at going forward. So Graham, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Nelson. Um, as Nelson said, um, I plan on going through effectively the, some of the economic costs and stats of what's happened with COVID-19. Um, we'll then move on to some broad um, correlations that have occurred and then the initial response of governments and then we'll compare it to the financial crisis and what we can suggest going forward. Um, I think at the moment it's fair to say that COVID is having a greater effect than the financial crisis did on global markets. Um, in terms of its scale, you've seen um, restaurant trade down between 20 and 80 percent across the globe. Um, you've seen retail trade down similarly and you've seen uh, global trade fall by 27% and over 180,000 flights have dropped down to 140,000. So you've seen a lot of industries affected. Um, the general view at the moment is the government is trying to spend now to a, a event a prolonged or slowed growth or negative growth later. Um, and estimates at the moment is that it's likely to cost um, the, economy, the global economy about a trillion dollars. Um, that is, I should say, the baseline scenario. There is the infamously called doomsday scenario, um, which would see that rise to approximately 2 trillion. And that would see global growth at 0.5%, which is quite a significant shift. Looking at infrastructure within this though, there is currently approximately 200 billion sitting in infrastructure funds that are unlisted across the globe, which is not allocated to projects. There's another 200 billion roughly that is being raised at the moment and that could unlock up to a trillion in spending and global growth so infrastructure does have the ability to counter some of the negative effects of this the issue we have is is that if you take the current rollout of those sorts of funds it would take seven or eight years for this capital to be invested if that's the case we're looking at a very similar trajectory out of covid that was in the financial crisis to give you some idea of the infrastructure gap um, it varies from Europe at 0.25% of GDP to Africa at 1.24%. If you then take 0.4% off global growth and add it to that gap, you could see the gap get larger. And that then also moves us further away from the sustainable development goals, which are above and beyond the current expenditure need. So as you can see, it's quite, it's quite a stark scenario. If we then look at um, effectively the correlations between um, the sort of economic performance and the measures that have been taken, it probably won't surprise people that the economies that have the most stringent measures have been affected most in terms of their growth. I think that's fair to say. And it has also been reflected in the PMI and consumer sort of um, surveys in a similar way. If we then go on to look at the initial response to COVID-19, Currently, there is around a five trillion, an estimated $5 trillion global response plan in the developed nations and the industrial nations, but it is anticipated that another 2.5 trillion is needed for the emerging economies. So we're looking at potentially the, the global governments at the moment having a war chest of seven and a half trillion. That's a significant amount of money. You've also got organizations within that, like the World Bank, that is planning to deploy up to 160 billion over the next 15 months. To put that in context, we have more or less spent in the COVID, in the response to the COVID crisis, what the fiscal package was to save us out of the financial crisis already. And we haven't actually entered the exit trajectory yet. Looking at the specific measures that companies have done, just for some interest to people, um, as was mentioned earlier, surveillance and tracking, 78% of countries across the globe have implemented. Increasing of diagnosing, testing and protective equipment, 84% of global countries have done. Mobilizing to protect health workers, 80% of countries have done. And additional funding and financing for healthcare systems, interestingly, only 38% have done. So there's lots of measures using existing resources, but there is still limited new money coming into the system. If we look at some of the taxes and measures that affect businesses, 53% um, of countries have implemented measures that affect personal income tax, so this is individuals. 66% of implemented measures where corporation income tax is affected. So as you can see, they have focused mostly on businesses, but there is still a very large emphasis on customers. 
If we look at business cash flow measures, 94% of global economies have implemented something. But interestingly, if you look at tax policy, tax policy to support further investment has only actually occurred in 13% of economies. So it's fair to say at the moment, the reactions of governments are very much focused on dealing with the COVID crisis at the moment. And so looking at an exit trajectory is becoming increasingly important. So what happens if we compare this to the financial crisis? It's fair to say that it, there's definitely similarities in terms of uncertainty. In fact, uncertainty is rated to be more or less two and a half to three times what it was in the financial crisis. Um, stock prices have fallen, um, but there was some evidence to suggest that they were uh, overvalued before the COVID crisis. And so if you take the financial crisis last time, it's reasonable to see a slight upswing, but there will be another downward adjustment slightly later on. This could be six to 12 months into the future. Um, in terms of um, the current crisis, it was caused by a supply shock to the economy mostly, um, whereas the previous one was a demand shock. It is important to stress, um, like Tony said earlier, ever, that this is not a financial crisis and financial institutions are in position this time to wield effectively their power and invest. Um, it is fair to say at the moment that whilst uh, there's a lot of talk about V-shape and U-shape, um, the V-shape is currently probably the trajectory on, but is increasingly looking like it's going to turn into a U-shape recovery because we're not reeling out the growth measures fast enough um, to deal with the swing out. So what can we expect going forward? Um, so the EU has recently agreed a 500 billion rec rescue package, um, but the ECB thinks that this needs to be um, up to 1.5 trillion. So you can see governments are still adjusting their expectations as to how they deal with the crisis on exit. Central banks have responded quickly to the crisis. Um, they have lowered interest rates in a lot of cases. We're unlikely to probably see further interest rate cuts given that they're near zero. Um, their balance sheets are quite significant in terms of size now, but this does turn around and actually allow spending and a way out. Um, there is some concern. If we look at the UK, for example, um, there are already documents that are hitting the press, um, which suggest that the deficit is going to hit 337 billion this year. Um, if you compare that to the financial crisis, it was 158 billion. So that's the equivalent of nearly 20% of our GDP. Um, and within this, there is talk of then having to implement another two to five years of austerity to help offset the package that has been put in place for COVID including public sector pay freezes again, which given the response of the public sector and the NHS, I don't think will be politically very um, sensitive at all. If we look at um, infrastructure itself in going forward, um, there are early signs that there's gonna be shifts in people's portfolios with regards to infrastructure towards more technology, broadband, housing and green type infrastructure. Um, this may be because they provide slightly better returns. It may be because it's slightly more resilient um, for example, the price of solar panels is still continuing to drop at a rate that has been unseen in markets for ages. So that's still there. Um, in terms of infrastructure policy, it's important to probably learn the lesson from the financial crisis that there was lots of talk about investing in infrastructure and infrastructure investment after three or four years did start to come back and did eventually increase. But it took a reasonable period for that to occur. If we are going to come out of a V-shape, it would be beneficial to open up the infrastructure spending earlier. And it was like I said earlier, if that's six to seven year for the unlisted funds, it will take time for that to hit the markets. Um, so at the moment, that is the stats and where we think the economic situation sits. And I want to hand back over to Nelson. Thank you very much, Graham, for that sort of high, high, excuse me. <clears throat> Thank you for that high level statistic. Obviously, I'm losing my voice on this. Uh, but the, grand, the figures are very staggering. I think if I were to pick up a lot of a uh, headline, uh, what we spent so far to get us to where we are is more than what we spend to get us out of the economic crisis we got in the last. And that was a big message. The second one that I gather from you is that trillions and possibly trillions of dollars need to be spent on infrastructure to come out. And different parts of are looking at issues to be looked at. The question for me uh, is that uh, what does this really mean in real world? What does it mean into the everyday life of what is happening? I'm delighted to invite Richard Trafford, Global Head of Infrastructure at KPMG, 
to give us his own thought on what these statistics mean and really what does he cite from looking around the world on infrastructure and what lesson can we learn and how best should our industry position ourselves to be a trusted advisor to the investor. So Richard, the floor is yours. Thank you. Nelson, thank you very much. Uh, thank you to yourself and uh, Bill and Fiddick for the invitation to present on today's WebEx. And uh, good morning, afternoon or evening to all of those uh, who are joining us from wherever you are in the world. Um, I'm casting my mind back, Nelson, to approximately 10 weeks when, 10 weeks ago when Europe started to go into lockdown. Um, and, and I remember very vividly that myself and many colleagues had three worries specifically around the uh, business of infrastructure. The first was, um, given all the money that was clearly already going to be thrown at trying to contain the pandemic and offset the impending uh, financial uh, meltdown, where would the money be for infrastructure in the future? And would that mean a, a massive collapse in pipelines? The second worry we had was, given that the whole of the world's focus and bandwidth and attention has moved to the pandemic, we've suddenly lost all of that pressure that was building around sustainability and climate change, and, and, and would that come back? And the third worry was, um, what is this going to mean for the construction industry? Um, historically, you know, known to be fragile, uh, looked at significant risk um, of taking a complete pounding, uh, and there were dire forecasts 10 weeks ago of, of uh, you know, the collapse of significant parts of the supply chain in short order. Let us now move forward to today. Um, and what I'm seeing in conversations all over the world is that all of those um, worries have been flipped round into a sense of opportunity. Um, firstly, as we've already heard a moment ago from Graham, uh, most governments almost immediately that the lockdown started focused on the role of infrastructure and construction spend as one way of keeping their economies going and already starting to look forward to the role of infrastructure and construction in economic recovery. And it was interesting, Tony, that, that you referenced specifically the way that Australia, for example, has maintained that focus in that industry all the way through and kept it open. And not all countries have kept the industry as open as Australia has been able to but generally there has been a recognition that it is a really, really important industry for maintaining economic growth. So for example, in the UK, the deliberate decision of the government to proceed with the contracts for high speed to phase one was taken for that reason. Um, but what we're seeing looking forward is many governments now saying, right, we need to focus on what are going to be the spend, what are going to be the projects that are going to drive the biggest economic impact going forward. Uh, and for example, we have just been working on, a, on an exercise for the New Zealand government, uh, which has been canvassing the views of both public and private sector participants in the market, how to identify those shovel ready projects that will drive that biggest economic boost as we get into the recovery phase post pandemic. Then let's turn to the environmental aspect. Again, the worry was that the world's attention would move away from climate change, despite the fact that we all know that bad as this pandemic is, it's nothing to what the world is about to inflict on itself if it doesn't urgently take action to get itself on a path to net zero in the timescales that many countries and regions have now committed to between 2030 and 2050, depending. Uh, actually, the evidence of the last six or eight weeks, I would say, has been hugely encouraging that governments and businesses seem to draw out of the lesson of what we are going through now, that we need to look after our planet much better than we have done in the past. We are seeing initiatives, particularly in Europe, around the Green Deal, which are pointing the way towards 
Um, if we are going to rebuild our economies, we are going to rebuild on a sustainable and resilient basis. Um, the money that is being offered to businesses, in many cases now, there is talk of that coming with strings attached, which will be around those businesses' adherence to principles that drive towards sustainability, adherence to ESG, um, and net zero in particular. Um, we had seen a, a huge um, increase uh, in the amount of financial uh, investment going into, for example, green bonds. There was a fourfold increase in investment in green bonds between 2018 and 2019. There was a fivefold uh, increase in the amount of money going into impact investing in the same period. Um, far from slowing, it appears that those trends are now going to accelerate. Um, uh, I saw uh, a report this morning um, that talked about uh, the green building sector uh, as being probably one of the fastest growth sectors now as we come out of the pandemic. And it was interesting then that Graham, you, you mentioned that sector specifically a moment ago. And then the third aspect of this around our own infrastructure and construction industry. Um, we have been painfully aware for decades um, of the weaknesses in the way that this industry operates globally. Um, and there have been some really powerful initiatives that have been taken in the world in the couple of years leading up to the pandemic and the lockdowns that we saw. In particular, uh, the work done in New Zealand around the construction accord, uh, the construction 2.0 initiative in Hong Kong that has articulated a way of driving greater uptake, uh, particularly of technology within the construction industry. Project 13, driven by the Institution of Civil Engineers in the UK, setting out how high performing um, owner organisations of infrastructure should, should seek to engage with their supply chains on a more collaborative basis and with a focus on long term value for money rather than short term cost minimisation. Um, the interesting debate I see opening up today, again in many countries simultaneously, is one that says okay, if we are going to be spending billions and billions of pounds of taxpayers' money supporting the recovery of our economies and the related industries. What are we going to ask for in terms of a new reality in our construction supply chain? And I think many governments, including the UK government, where I'm deeply involved in these conversations, are seeing this as an opportunity to actually try to create a more robust industry in the future. And I think we should all massively welcome that. Um, in particular, uh, I'm seeing it articulated like this. Firstly, um, a desire to create a much higher level of self um, uh, financial sustainability within the construction industry so that it has the ability to invest much more rapidly in new technology and also in investment in the new skills that this industry needs uh, as we increasingly move towards a more data uh, focused governance for the industry in terms of all aspects of its decision making. Um, and secondly, I'm seeing uh, governments again all over the world um, talk about if this is the industry of the future um, that we want in construction, how are we going to help the industry to focus on the sorts of projects that are going to deliver that green revolution? And this then I think brings us to an interesting challenge that governments are facing all over the world, which is if on the one hand they want the projects that drive the biggest economic stimulus, how do they also ensure that those are the projects which are going to be consistent with their focus on net zero and sustainability. And clearly we can see there could be some conflicts in that. Traditionally, for example, many governments have found that, you know, moving to road resurfacing or new road projects is one of the quickest ways of getting money into the supply chain. But those sorts of projects will no longer tick the boxes of environmental sustainability. What we're expecting to see 
um, is a much greater focus, for example, um, on rapid acceleration of the electric vehicle market, which means in particular electric vehicle infrastructure. Uh, a massive focus on all forms of digital communication infrastructure in order to be able to um, lock in some of the reduced need for travel that we have seen over recent months. So that will include 5G and fiber cabling in particular. Um, a much bigger focus on decarbonization um, of heat and of renewable energy sources generally, notwithstanding the fall in the price of oil that is obviously otherwise going to mitigate against the growth of renewable markets. Um, much bigger investment in green buildings, as I mentioned a moment ago, and then coming back to the construction industry itself, much greater pressure for the construction industry to invest in a circular economy in its own industry and reduce its reliance, particularly on materials, um, which are big drivers um, of, uh, uh, of carbon emissions. Um, so I think I'll stop there, Nelson. I think that probably gives a bit of a summary of where I, I think governments are going. Um, I think there is a view out there um, that in some cases uh, there is too much optimism of what governments might be able to achieve. Um, but I have heard many officials say to me in the last weeks that they have an ability to achieve things today um, because of government's grip on, on the economy and the amount of money they're going to be spending, which is far exceeds their political ability to do stuff uh, in the past. So I don't think any of us should be surprised if there is some real seriousness about putting into place the sorts of things that I've talked about. Thank you, Thank very, you, very, much. Thank you very much, Richard. Thanks a lot for that. I think he's, uh, he's, it's actually quite uh, uh, mind-blowing to say that you said 10 weeks ago, we started with three worries. And those three worries has turned out into today becomes an opportunity. And actually, you're leaving us with the thought, can we, can we respond to the challenge? And it's not just about the challenge at government level, because it's huge investment opportunity that is in the pipeline, but also can we re take advantage of the industry and use that to reshape the industry so that industry delivers a sustainable asset base and also our industry becomes sustainable because we know how fragmented our industry is, how contentious our industry is. And I'm actually quite interested to move on across now to talk to Mark and see what Mark's take on it. We're looking at him from the point of view of financing Yes, there's a lot of money in place. Question is, how much money is in place? Are we using it wisely? And are there other techniques in the industry for us to use to actually channel those in, uh, in investment into the right form? So Mark Warrell, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nelson. And um, hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Um, I'm going to sort of, I think there's, we've been talking a little bit about what's been going on. And I'm going to try and take this by looking forward, because I think financing things should be about the future. Um, so I'm going to do two things. One is I'm just going to talk a little bit about what we do because I've just, you probably, a lot of you don't know who we are. Uh, and the second component is then I'll talk a little bit about and pick up on some of the threats that uh, you've all spoken about uh, over your various countries and, and, and uh, continents. So first of all, um, so we are a new exchange that's regulated here in the city of London. Uh, we uh, take a project, whether public, private or mixture of both, we put it into a special purpose vehicle and uh, we then wrap it in a bond and we list it onto our own exchange. So the journey fundamentally that we're on is to turn infrastructure from being an investable asset class into being a tradable one. And that changes the dynamic for the market because it means that risk can be, or the risk of the projects can be used specifically to be offset by the debt capital markets uh, in a wider context than it's ever been done before because you can use hedging strategies to do that. So it's an important place because it allows money to view risk in a different way. It can come into a project, but it can also get out of a project. And that is a key factor. But moving, moving on to the, to the world as it can be, I think the first thing is um, we still talk a lot about, with a lot of conferences I've been to, still talk about what, um, how we create money and put money in place for new things or how we finance the next thing. But in this pandemic, I think there is a key point that we should also look at if we're in a place where we think it's difficult to be able to invest into, especially if we're talking about frontier countries. And that in particular is actually looking at existing assets that you already have invested into. How can you leverage those existing assets 
to actually allow you to put the equity, if you will, into those projects to attract the private capital to allow your equity to go further in country. And that segmentation, if you will, of putting different risk capital into different segments is a really important element to be able to accelerate infrastructure placement. And I think, you know, the point that um, Bill made earlier that for every dollar you invest, you make $1.20 return speaks for itself. But an education, it's even greater. It's, you know, three or four times over a 20 year period. So the question has to be is how do you increase the flow of those projects? Um, so, for example, we're working with the World Bank uh, with their City Resilience Program, which is a deployment pre-pandemic of $65 billion to 40 places. And the question for them has been, how do I price resilience? And you could add ESG credentials to that as well. Um, and how do you actually then deploy that capital more cleverly? And what's interesting is then how you think about who the investors might be into these projects. And the investors into these projects, you know, who, if you can rate them long enough tenor and you can provide enough guarantee behind it and let's face it we're in a world where the governments these days are wondering are worrying less about their PSBR the public sector borrowing requirement that they might have done before you could actually use that in a way that really takes things forward differently from the way they would have done otherwise so sovereign wealth groups you know particularly the Scandinavian groups are looking for long-term you know money to match their assets and liabilities and they need longer tenor but actually an infrastructure is a really good place to look for this because it does actually attract a much better return. However, there's a sting in the tail for us, as some of you have already talked about. And it's talked about little, but fundamentally, there's a margin issue for the people that are building these projects. So maybe this is also not only an opportunity to highlight ESG and to highlight some of the other elements, which are, you know, how do we get projects just going, but also how do we get the flow of projects increased and pay the right price, make the money pay the right price for things to be delivered on time and on budget, because you can actually increase the risk profile of the what the money is paying for. So there's an education piece in data here, which is really, really important. If we can get clean data reporting back from projects or from existing assets that need operation and maintenance, and you can use that oil, if you like, to actually fuel what we need, but to in, in order to understand how a program of projects can be taken off, then you can start to pay the margin for the risk the contractors take. And I think it's a really important piece that actually it's a probably uh, a point of inflection through this crisis and in the, for the improvement of this industry to actually allow us to actually be able to say what is the right correct risk profile, what is the correct risk pricing for a project to be delivered on time and on budget. And not enough time is spent thinking about that. And instead of what, what has happened prior to the pandemic for sure is a run to the bottom all the time where we try and squeeze margins for contractors for the risk that they take. And if we can readdress that by allowing someone like ourselves to catalyze, of course, I would say that, but also other industries where you're taking a balance of assets from an equity perspective that already exist, leveraging those for equity, and then using a new world to actually make the world understand, the investor people understand, that if they pay the right price over a good tenor period, then they can actually get a much better return. Actually, there's more consistent and where they're taking less risk. I know it's slightly sound like ironic given the problems they had, but right now this could be a real changing position. And in particular, not just for the countries, the Western countries, but in particular across all frontier sectors, because that is exactly what you need to catalyze the growth is to provide greater creditworthiness by doing that. There's also something that I think we should look to. I mean, oil we have seen come off quite a long way. And I know it's not, a, not an ESG subject, but a lot of the big players in that um, market, such as Shell or BP, for example, um, are very pushing big infrastructure projects, um, at least in the renewable energy sector, by providing offtake agreements. And this can be especially helpful when you look at it on a global basis, because if the credit rating of a particular country or place is difficult to be able to reach international private capital, then actually by supplying an offtake agreement, which actually is really meaningful and raises the rating to, for example, a shell listing, because it's doing is actually paying for the money, but the repayment of the capital, then actually more projects can be taken away. But the way to do this is not project by project. You have to put programs of projects together, like the World Bank CRP program. For example, we recently, it's about sport, but we recently won a big contract in that, wherever, and it's a program of work continuously over eight years. 
And it's the same positioning that you need to take, or the EIB EMTN paper would be the same, which is very ESG driven, would be another program, for example, that we're participating in. So these programs are really important to think of them not as single projects, but actually to get away from that and think of them as programs of work. And it's also important to get away from the edict of only thinking about nations, but think about municipalities. There's a lot of power actually in the local authority or municipality that has, and you can see this in particular in countries that do it very well, America being one because of the way it's put together, and of course Australia is the other, and there's the two speakers talked about before. So what's really important though, how about looking at that in other ways? So in the UK, for example, that might be Liverpool and Manchester, or it might be Scotland. But it, and the same thing will be for any one of your countries is actually how do you look at the regions of those countries that actually enable you to leverage what you have and make something of it. You may need to get some level of autonomy, but it's a quick way if you can accelerate that asset creation. I think the other thing to think about is um, in a more of a panacea at, at uh, government level, and I may slightly contradict myself here, is that you look, at, you look very much at the idea of a war bond, if you like, in the sense of the Second World War in Europe, what we did is we issued war bonds where we did very long tenors, so 50 to 100 years. And we could park the problem, if you will, at the site. I mean, it still counts within the numbers, but you park it outside of the period. And that could be something else that you could do. So, you know, could the sovereign in particular of a country or municipality issue paper that allowed them to solve a program of work in a different way? And that money could very well attract international sovereign capital, removing the requirement for the local tax people to actually enable them to do that. So the tax it moves the tax burden away from the, from the local purse, and it has this singular advantage of the money arriving today, not tomorrow, for the programs of work that you need. Um, and I think if you combine all of those elements, right now is a time to push. It's that point of inflection, as I said, and as, as Richard talked about before, if you can combine the willingness, if you like, from those three problems today to where we are now with a couple of practical solutions of how you allow investors to look at risk and return. After all, there isn't going to be an awful lot of long term return at the moment. The yields were bad last year, let alone this year. So they're definitely looking at ways of matching assets and liabilities. So if you can help them do that, you can improve your own margins in terms of your everyday position. And I think you can look forward in a sense of actually being able to improve this industry in no way, in every way. Thank you, Rich. Uh, thank you, Richard, and thank you, um, Nelson. Thank you very much, uh, Matt, for that insight. We are looking through this. I think your approach of saying, why don't you leverage on your existing assets? Why did you find an innovative way of finding the solution? Does the government have to raise more trillions and trillions and write more bond? Uh, if you had to go to that, um, how do you look at you know, solving uh, this long time issue of financing project when actually the current yield is very zero. And you talk about the capacity available in the marketplace. It seems to me there's a lot of opportunity out there, even though they sound very new, more important, actually get excited about the idea of war bond. Do we have a COVID-19 bond? Is that what you're implying? And if we create that, could that be an opportunity to help us on this point of inflection? A lot has been said from Bill, looking through across what's happening in the United States, uh, but also giving us perspective and he touched on you know the sort of issue about the state of the world and issues about sustainability and that trend seems to come across on all the speaker uh, graham touched on this statistic that came up and i just want to start off before i open the floor of a question uh, i know barbara will send a message now to those who are participating we have nearly 800 people registered and people are in and out uh, i understand that question will be coming up in a minute but just before i do that can I start off with Mark, since you're coming off, off the press? You know, if I start off with you, Mark, you said uh, <clears throat> war bond. Uh, are we talking about COVID-19 bond? And if that's the way, could this be the opportunity for government uh, to actually create, you know, a long time paper that is tradable? Is that, is that what you're saying, Mark? Yes, I, yes, I am saying that. Um, and we're engaged with three, three governments at the moment around the world. Um, talking to them about that that program of work, um, it, the idea simply is that you you can you can raise um, a a block of money that today would allow you to you know invest in that economic infrastructure going forward, um, perhaps on a green basis as well, which we're very keen on, uh, and you would do that you would do that now, and and the the beauty of that is the as I say if you if you try and raise the money from 
by increasing the tax burden, you do that over a period of time. Uh, you don't get all your money today. And actually what you need is if you're trying to get to make it, whether it's going to be a, a V-shaped, U-shaped or L-shaped recovery, um, and it takes longer, then actually this, is, this has the benefit of getting the money into the coffers today. And as we've seen in particular in, with many governments, the deployment of capital has been slower than the headlines uh, because of the practicality of getting the money to people. Now, if you're going to then create jobs and replace the engine room, if you like, uh, and get the engine going, you need to, you need to fuel that much sooner um, in order to get out of the problem. And I think you probably deserve to be fairly aggressive, let's say, in how you're going to do it, because otherwise you, you're, not, you're going to have to think differently about how you go about it. So a COVID bond would have the benefit of, uh, of simply uh, having longer tenors, which match assets and liabilities from walls of money that exist both in insurance, pension funds and sovereign wealth groups. Uh, and it would have that benefit. And programmes in particular of work across many countries would have the ability for them to be able to take a portfolio approach, which enable them to spread risk. And that, that therefore, if we all did it together, I think you'd have a better, a better impact rather than everyone trying to do it singularly. So if a programme of work could be brought forward to do that, then I think that would be beneficial. Um, Thanks very much, Mike. I'm going to come to no, that issue. I, may I just come in on this a second? Because I think it's a really powerful idea. And there's one other massive attractiveness to it, which is what I call social fairness. Um, the... The, the, the big issue about infrastructure has always been that we're building assets that are going to benefit three, four, five generations over 100 or 150 years sometimes, yet we end up trying to pay for them in this generation. And I think particularly given the amount of economic pain um, that the lockdowns have created for uh, the younger generations that are trying to go into work at the moment, um, it's really very, very hard if we then try to rebuild all of the world's economies effectively off, off, off their wealth, rather than spreading um, so you better match um, the, the cost of the infrastructure with when the benefit of the infrastructure falls. So if we can create 100 year bonds to do that, that would actually be intergenerationally and socially a really fair outcome. Well, it's interesting, Richard, I was going to come to you, but you picked the message, but I'm going to put the question back to you. If this is one of the way to go forward, and I'm going to come to Tony in a minute, because he keeps saying to me, they have a deficit and they have 30 billion to spend. I'm going to come back to you, Richard. You talk to government around the world. At what point do you need to make this influence? Is it at the treasury or is it more of a cabinet? Because it seems to me that sometime, and in my experience being a, you know, a CEO of uh, AC UK, was that we were able to get close to the treasury by actually sharing a thought leadership approach and helping them to overcome the barrier that we've never done it before. And there's a new way of thinking. So Richard, you are connected with different government around the world. How do you think we can get that message across that there is new way of taking a long-term view rather than a short view of, uh, of investment? Richard? Sure. So um, I mean, it clearly depends a little bit on the, on the nature of the governance of individual countries. But I think what is really interesting is we are seeing at the moment an interplay of discussion between local, uh, local governments, cities and regions and national governments uh, around trying to establish what, what is the vision of the new reality that we want. That, that to me is the starting question um, that everybody is circling around but hasn't really articulated yet. Because if you can articulate that, then you can then go to the uh, questions of, OK, so what are our priorities um, and what are, how would we pay for it questions? But they sort of need to follow. Otherwise, a bit of a risk is that you just fall into the trap of doing things the way you've always done them before. Um, and I think it is, you know, uh, critical to engage Treasury in this because Treasury needs to buy uh, the financial um, and intellectual argument uh, that says it's a better outcome in the long run for all the reasons that, uh, uh, that Mark has so, has so neatly articulated. Um, uh, and also because fundamentally this is about creating a virtuous circle, a uh, virtuous spiral of economic recovery. It's about finding ways to put as much money into economies now, which drive economic growth, which put money back in people's pockets, which ultimately put money back into the hands of, of, of treasuries, um, and create the ability to continue to reinvest in the future. And I think if, if we can get treasuries to understand um, that that is the reason that we're doing this, 
then hopefully they will be far less inclined to do what you know is, is normally the reaction of, of of seeking to clamp down on cost um, and creating that austerity that's been referred to already and um, which in many ways i agree with other commentators would be the worst of all worlds because we'll just compound um, the locking up of, of, of our economic potential just to the point where we need to be in massive expansionist mode thank you very much richard and <laughs> twenty uh, I'm going to come to you now. You raised the issue that uh, there is a, a deficit. We had the Australian fire. We're coming out of that. We're not totally out of it. Then we got COVID, although the impact is not as severe. But we need to kickstart the economy because government has been paying now. Do you feel that you know our industry is ready, or do we need to go through some of those issues that Richard talked about earlier on about structural change? To because every time I hear. There's no money in the construction industry. The profit margin is low and everybody's fighting each other. There is huge opportunity. Richard said, we started with worries. We are now looking at the opportunity and Graham is saying, can we deliver? So how do we address this issue? <laughs> Tony. Well, that, that, that's a big question, Nelson. You probably hold another webinar on it. Um, <laughs> the, the, I, I think there's a, a couple of things. If I could just pick up on some key key points that uh, firstly, uh, Australia is in the very wonderful position of uh, having uh, budgeted this year for a surplus. And uh, it's had, uh, as many of you know, we haven't had a recession, albeit we've had some uh, things that look a lot like a recession, but we haven't had uh, two quarters of negative growth for 30 years. So we've got a pretty healthy place. The government government coffers are pretty well stocked. Our retirement funds are full of cash uh, and looking for places for that money to go. I think one of the very important elements, therefore, is to create the voice in government. You talk about treasury. In our country, the treasury guys are the ones who collect it and protect it. There are other guys who spend it. And, and you have to create a circumstance where the guys who are collecting it and protecting it aren't the ones who are controlling all the spending. So you have to create uh, pressures within government. And so we have a minister for finance, for example. Um, we have uh, the looks on how you spend it and, why, and controls how you spend it. But we have all of these other voices in government uh, which are looking to get out there and do things. And I think that uh, creating those voices is very important and it's very important they're resourced well and they're capable of, if you like, building the business case for whether it's infrastructure, whether it's physical infrastructure or social infrastructure or whatever it is, or services, uh, those groups have to be able to mount the case and prove the case uh, to the point where they will get a share of the pie. And I think uh, many governments around the world, uh, you can call it governance if you like, but many governments around the world, in my observation, appear to be far less capable of organizing those different views and, and promoting uh, the sort of activity that you might need to get out of this one quickly. So that's a challenge. And, and not all political systems are uh, easy, if you like, to navigate, to, to make these things happen. So, you know, I think there's a, there is definitely a political piece to it. I do think in both the consulting industry and the construction industry uh, have to be able to argue their case. And this does require a level of sophistication and support. It does require us to be able to propose solutions in countries where, if you like, the budget health or the access to government borrowings is not as strong as it may be in other places. So there are, I think there's a lot of work to be done by the industry to be able to persuade people. Now, if, if you, uh, I've mentioned earlier, we have this uh, national uh, commission that's been developed uh, to uh, help us navigate our way out of the COVID-19 economic situation. And that commission uh, and the eminence of the people on it and the respect with which they're held in the country has enabled or has created a voice specifically around economic uh, growth and exiting this COVID-19 crisis. So that, that commission uh, is, is really resourced well it's, and it's doing all the sorts of things that have been talked about here tonight in terms of promoting and developing strategies for many industries to come out of this in a good way. 
So I, I do think it's about your mechanisms. I think it's about the voices you create and it's making sure that they're resourced to get out of it. Our problem isn't finance. Um, uh, there's no doubt our problem is bankable projects and the political will uh, to make them happen. And I'll give you a very simple example. We've just come out of four years of drought before we had this bushfire season from hell. Um, I will, uh, you know, I'll tell you that bushfire season from hell was extremely difficult for about half the population in the country. It, it, it had a social impact that was extraordinary. Um, but the four years of drought before it created a circumstance where the biggest issue we face is water security. And we, we export enough food out of this country for 75 million people. Sorry, we produce enough food for 75 million people. We, well, there's only 25 million of us. So it, it's an industry, the agriculture is an industry where water security is vital. So it's a, it's a real no brainer to get in and sort out some of the uh, irrigation and the agricultural infrastructure, water infrastructure to provide security to that industry. And it's not hard to do. So there, it's just a matter of creating the voices, the energy, the debate, and making sure that you manage the debate, uh, debate to a quick end and we get on with it. I think too many countries will be just stuck having the debate. And I think you've got to make sure that we've got the mechanisms to go through it. Okay, thanks very much, uh, um, Tony, about that, making a distinction between Treasury, who collects the money and wants to keep the money, and the voices that actually say, how best can we invest the money? Uh, I'm going to come to you, Graham. I mean, Graham, you, you talked about the massive uphill uh, that we have if we really, if we go into the market and try to sort of burn all the money for investment. Do you sense that, you know, the will is there from the statistical data you're seeing that the shift that Richard is talking about, that a smart way of technology, renewable, and even net zero. Do you sense, you know, any statistic giving us that confirmation that perhaps investors and government are looking at this issue as a way to go? Because I hear the word 5G from Richard. I hear the word about net zero. I hear also uh, from uh, Mark talking about those energy companies such as Shell moving into renewable, and that could be opportunity. Do you get any signal at all for shift? in the expectation, Graham? Uh, I mean, to answer yes, that I mean, there are some shifts in investment trends and COVID-19 is definitely gonna affect the portfolios of companies when they put infrastructure investment into the ground. Um, I think what's important and what to, is to learn out of the last financial crisis is that connecting the finance, the project and the political and the uh, treasury will, and then getting it through to the construction sector is the key bit because any one of the three elements can sort of stop the process occurring. But as has been mentioned by some of the other panelists, there is opportunity here. So I noticed someone on the questions mentioned India and what emerging economies do. If you look at India, their gap is quite small in terms of their day-to-day -day infrastructure. It's around 4%. But then if you look at the SDGs on top of it, their gap increases significantly, more than doubles. So all of the opportunity is in the sustainable and green infrastructure area. And so I do think you're going to see that shift going forward. Um, someone did also ask about the, the Spanish flu and how the economy came out of that. Um, interestingly, that happened around the same time as a global war. So spending was ramped up massively, but for a totally different reason. Well, thank you very much uh, my, uh, you know, for doing my work for me. I think you're picking up the question. I'm trying to you know, avoid you know, putting that question to you guys. But if you want to do it, I'm quite happy to chill out and have a drink. But coming back into the issue, obviously, there is an issue that's going on about different parts of the world that are facing similar issues, albeit at different points. Is there a need for collaboration at geography level? I hear somehow, I'm not quite sure whether it was Graham talking about European Union putting 500 billion across Europe. I also hear in the early sector that, you know, Bill was talking about America putting trillions and trillions into it. Do we see that there's an opportunity for regional collaboration or is it very much at national level? This is all to the panel. Richard, you know, what's your take on it? Thank you, Nelson, I was just unmuting. Um, so I think one of the, uh, one of the worrying uh, issues uh, that has come through the last, uh, uh, the last uh, few months has been the struggle to get a proper international collaboration around the response COVID-19. Um, 
Uh, and, and I think it's concerning, particularly as we look forward to this bigger challenge around climate change, um, mm -hmm. worrying whether it will actually be possible to get the degree of international collaboration that will be necessary in order to solve that. Um, my own view is the world just needs to redouble every effort around multilateralism, um, recognising that we just cannot solve these issues in isolation. Um, uh, there is a significant risk that what is happening uh, is, is driving countries much more back within their own borders. Obviously, we've seen in particular uh, the uh, uh, massive uh, um, restriction in terms of air travel for understandable reasons at this present time. Um, but the risk is we come out of it with a belief that all countries need to focus much more on themselves and much less about their role within a global ecosystem. And if I come back to this, this, this idea of the, of the COVID bond, you know, I heard Mark say very powerfully that it meant that international investors could be tapped in order to support um, what would otherwise be a burden falling just on the taxpayers of that country. If you take that particularly into the developing market scenario, where evidently there is not the capacity within that taxpayer base, even for the trajectories to, to realise the UN Sustainable Development Goals, let alone for the economic repair that is needed as we come out of this crisis, then it's even more important that we have these vehicles that allow us to pull the global finance in order to be able to direct it where it can be most effective. Thank you very much, Richard. I'm going to pick up a few questions from the floor. Some of these have already been answered. Some of the questions by the tone of different panelists here, speech earlier, we've already addressed that. Um, there's a particular one which is actually of, uh, of interest to me, and I think a lot of people looking at that, is I know we've talked about we need to find bankable projects. I think in the case of Tony, Tony said, we're not short of finance. If that's not the issue, we need bankable projects that can return. Um, and the question is coming from the floor is, uh, how would you model the PPP concession that is being affected by this still amidst of the new imposition of risk of COVID? It's a very complex question, my mind, but actually it's a real question in the sense that, you know, your PPP is based on forecast uh, on the future capacity of either utilization and all of it. And if you look at a lot of, you know, PPP projects in the pipeline, where you made the forecast of what you know the usage is going to be, and suddenly it crashed. Does this mean we need to go back to fundamental and look at a different model? Uh, you know, Mark, what's your take on it? <laughs> Sorry, just unmuting. Um, yeah, it is a complex question. I mean, ultimately, regardless of the structure of the deal, whether a PPP or otherwise, it really comes down to two things. One is what is the the surety, what is my assurance, what is how I, that I feel as an investor that I'm going to get my money back with the return that I think I, that I'm prepared to invest for. Um, so I think fundamentally that, 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 that stays the same. And within that scenario analysis that someone putting money into, into an investment, re regardless of where it is, um, they'll be taking that into account and obviously trying to hedge out as much of the tails of risk as they possibly can before they make that investment. Um, and I think, you know, if you have an open process like we run on an exchange, then what happens is that you get a, you get a sense of the depth of interest in, that, in how you've constructed that model. So at the moment, what happens is you tend to do this on a project by project basis, you know, however you structure it. But you don't really know until, you, until it's started whether it's going to go well or not and, and how the investors think about it. And that's, there are plenty of examples around the world where it's probably a good idea to ask the money first. Uh, I know that people talk about there's, there's enough money, yes, but, but the way the market is constructed today means that not necessarily is it packaged in the correct way for, for that money to flow more. I mean, we've got this massive funding gap in the world and, you know, asking, you know, even all the investment bankers in the world to put these deals together as private placements in whatever structures, PPP or otherwise, um, isn't enough to increase the flow to the point where she's going to solve the problem for the gap that we had even pre-COVID, even to post-COVID if we're gonna have an economic impact. And so you've got to look at it in a way of saying, if we could repackage the deals to increase the flow so investors could actually understand that they could take a little bit of a higher risk profile and you could share that risk across all of that money that is available, you start to be able to build portfolios of risk in a different way, but you can move them away from being, let's say, 
investing into developed countries into taking pieces in other countries in order to keep increase that flow and it's that flow that is missing not the money itself i agree with that but it's how do you get the flow going and making that happen and flow to other parts where people are prepared to take a bit of a bit more risk um, but at the margin of their portfolio um, so i think the so the answer is you know you have it, it's difficult but but i think the question is it's we it's not about cost and it's not about margin it's about risk and we you've got to price risk correctly if you don't price risk correctly then you start in the wrong place whichever whichever whoever you are as a participant thank you very much i mean i have a question there said uh, should there be a need for high level cooperation among countries we've talked about that uh, particularly to do with covid 19 i suspect this is happening there was a question about is philly going to produce a guide on how to deal with covid 19 there has been a number of guides that's been produced by philly so please go to our website and have a look at it question by hamish goldie hamish somebody i know very well is talking about costing which we are heavily involved with is asking, is this an opportunity for Philly to talk about it? Yes, absolutely. It's an opportunity for us to talk about it. Amish, I know where you're coming from. Uh, the key question that I really want to put across in is, it seems to me that we are going into a new norm. A new norm that means that, you know, expectation of investor, expectation of government, and also even in our own industry, we completely change. Um, you know, I'm going to pick Richard. Richard, I think it was Richard that talked about 5G. And also, I hear also about Mark talking about the new infrastructure that is going to come through. Uh, if I flip back into UK, uh, we debated high speed two, and maybe we need to go all the way through, third wrong way, you go into different parts of the world with the new norm of maybe 40% of people want to work from home. How do we address that issue in terms of what industry need to do and how the industry need to respond to make sure government get the right advice and actually, we are seen to be that trusted advisor who can enable them to deliver value for money. Richard, what's your take on that? Yes, no, um, I mean, I think this, this is the fundamental question. You Sorry, you, you're not clear. Can you come closer, please? Thank you. <laughs> what, what, what is, um, you know, the key, key question is, what is our articulation of what this new normal is going to look like? Um, yeah. I think there is a huge expectation amongst businesses, ourselves included, as KPMG, um, that colleagues who have enjoyed not commuting five days a week, but, you know, an hour each way into the middle of a city, now they recognise the technology is there, that means they don't have to do that to work effectively. We expect some of that to want to stick. Um, equally, um, this is an opportunity for the world to work more effectively globally, because one of the things that we've noticed for years as a global professional services organisation is that most clients restrict the people that can support them to those who are able to turn up in their offices on a regular basis. Whereas now, perhaps there'll be a recognition that you can bring the best experts in from all over the world, just as long as you're prepared to do it virtually. And if we've done it through the last 10 weeks, why shouldn't we be able to do it in the future? And, and I think it will therefore have ramifications for um, the business cases for infrastructure, um, are going to need to be reconsidered in the light of uh, a view as to how much the world is going to reset. Um, and I think it therefore means that the process of prioritisation of how we spend the money we do have available in order to drive economic recovery, that needs to be effectively rebaselined. It needs to start with a new blank sheet of paper and say, this is the articulation of where the world's likely to go. This is our articulation of the new normal we want now what are the projects that are going to get us there and our challenge is to do that very quickly thanks very much richard there's a question from the floor which is really for um, um i think it's for tony and i think they're really picking on you now tony i think the message is everything is okay in australia we, we have no problem in australia in fact we just need to get bankable projects what happened if you're in bangladesh uh, in difficult parts where there's lockdown and, and you can deal with this and how do you how do you get over that? Yet people still need infrastructure uh, and really the whole transaction is frustrated. So I'm sure you can read the question. What's your interpretation response to that, Tony? <laughs> well, uh, there's, a, there's a number of issues in that. And I do think this um, brings up the, the point of the need for, you know, we talk about it inside our businesses about mentoring. We talk about people partnering. We talk about all this wonderful collaborative language. Many of us, went into COVID-19 earlier than others. 
And if you look around, the, look at those wonderful curves that we all see each other day, um, there are some countries that are on their way out. And there are other countries which at the moment are going in. And it's fair to say, I think, that the developed countries are, a lot of them, on their way out already. And many of the developing countries are just going in. And I do think it behoves the countries that are less affected to partner up in their region and, and support those countries that might not be so well supported uh, at home. And I know in Australia's case, the amount of aid going into the Pacific at the moment in this, uh, as a result of this, and the uh, hurricane cyclones and so forth that have been going through there, that amount of aid is ramping up directly and it's moving away from what used to be what I'll call Australian aid going into directly funding the governments to try and get through. So I do think there is, uh, I do think uh, countries should call on their friends. This is a time to do it um, and to make sure that you get the help you need. Um, I, I think there is a tremendous work. I personally believe there's a huge amount of work for the multilateral banks to do. Uh, in governance improvement in many countries that will help them navigate this path in a better way. And I think the other massively challenging problem, and we've definitely got this in Asia, throughout Asia, the idea of social distancing is almost amusing in some places. I don't mean that to be flippant, but it's, it is clearly, if you know what's happened in Singapore with the uh, workers from uh, South Asia that come into Singapore, They've converted the convention centres into living accommodation for people because there was no way they could meet the social distancing requirements. And as you know, Singapore has a huge number of cases relative to a small population uh, as a result. So I think there's a lot of partnering up. There's a lot of collaboration re required and a lot of support. And I'm, uh, I'm very interested. I know there are many financing mechanisms that could help us go through here into a better place. But a lot of it does mean we've got to solve the risks, uh, the risk pricing issue. We've got to solve uh, the, if you like, uh, the returns, uh, as you well know, returns 30 in 30 years time aren't worth a lot in today's terms. So it, it is pretty important that uh, we develop mechanisms that will enable us to balance that risk against the returns and make sure that We've got an instrument that works and markets may well be one way of doing it. Thank you very the other much. thing I, I would comment on, and I would just say to, to, I think there's going to be a swing back to wanting to work in community again. Working from home's okay to a point and a flexibility that it offers people is fantastic. But I do think we're in a position where people will want to get back and be, we are all social beings, get back there and enjoy the experience. Thank you very much, Tony. I think you've given me a lot of food for thought on that. I'm going to go around the table now to try and ask for that one sentence. I think you've given more than two sentences. I'm, of I'm done. So you've got, <laughs> you're done. You're done, Tony. So I'm going to start with Graham. Being an insider, what do you think would be the one thing that Felix should be looking at? I'm coming to you, Richard, and then after that will be Mark and then with Bill. So Graham, your comment. It, one it, comment, it, sentence. It would be leveraging it would be leveraging the investment and money that currently exists to focus on the short term out of the crisis. When you get into the medium and longer term, we have time to address those issues. So it would be to focus on the next two to three year period. Okay, thank you very much, Richard. Same with you. What's the one takeaway that we need to be mindful of? Um, that we should treat what we're all going through as an opportunity, um, both to, to learn the threat uh, to the world if we don't respect it. Um, uh, and to build a more sustainable and resilient future. Okay, I'm going to come to you, Mark. Your take one sentence, take it away. Very, very straightforward. Be bold. It's an opportunity to be bold. Thank you. And Bill, you started it. I'm going to ask you to wrap it up with a very, very short sentence to try and wrap up because I want to finish on time, Bill. <laughs> Can you unmute, Bill? I can't hear you. I, I apologize. Um, I'll, I'll just close with uh, what I started. I, I would really ask all member associations to get very close to uh, those that can help us with infrastructure programs uh, to get out of this uh, 
out of this situation, governments, agencies, banks, et cetera. We've got a lot to, to tell them uh, and we can really be of tremendous help. Once again, we've heard a lot about collaboration, a new way of working. I like the part about pricing and risk. Boy, if we could ever figure that out, that would be uh, great for everyone, especially our clients. So back to you, Nelson. Thank you very much, Bill. I want to start by saying massive thank you to uh, Graham, to Bill, to Tony, Richard, and Mark for your time. Uh, thank you to my team, Barbara, and the rest of the team who are behind the scene to make sure this team work like a clockwork and they have a means of prompting me to make sure we don't go beyond the time. I want to say thank you to all those who participated from wherever you're at, you're at around the world. Uh, for the support you've given to this particular issue. I know there's a lot of questions that came through. Unfortunately, we were unable to address that. I've been picky and I apologize. Uh, we can't cover all the questions, but be rest assured uh, that Felix will be looking through this and trying to address this. A lot of questions have been asked about guidance notes and all sorts of issues. Yes, Felix is producing guidance notes and have a look on our website, they are there. I also want to leave a challenge to both Mark and also to Richard. I know your company produced some your thought leadership document, which you put out there, we'll be quite happy to collaborate with you and push it into our market. If there is a material there that we can make use of, we've done that with different firms in the past. We have no problem in doing that. But also to those people who are joining us, different time zones, different area of the world, uh, we want to sort of say, you know, we hope you are keeping safe. For those who lost a loved one, uh, our sincere condolence. This is a difficult time for the rest of the world, but we are working. And I hope that the new norm will help us to make us into a new and better people, better society, and more important, better industry. Richard left us with some food of thought. We went into it with worries. We can see real opportunity coming up. We should grab the opportunity. We should walk with it. We should run with it. Um, I always say to people, I never see problems. I see challenges. And as an engineer, we solve challenges and we find a solution. So I hear the word MDB ought to be engaged. The next one is going to be on Tuesday where we have the multilateral development bank. We've got all of them, all of them. They are going to talk to us. They are going to give us their view. Graham talked about how much money they're spending, billions and billions. And we need to understand where they're spending the money, how we can work with them and how best we should position ourselves. So on that note, I want to say thank you to everybody who's participated, wish all the very best and God bless. Thank you very much.